Satoshi Kon's Perfect Blue is one of the best animated psychological thrillers ever made. Its dominance in the genre is still apparent through its influence on many directors. On the other hand, Toshiki Sato's Perfect Blue is a steaming pile of garbage. And you know what? It was almost the version we got. At the very least, it helps us answer one question. What if Perfect Blue was bad? So before we get into both these films, I have to talk about the production of Perfect Blue and how we got the masterpiece from a tragedy. Some of you may not know that Perfect Blue was actually based off a book. Not a manga, but an actual novel with words. In 1991, Yoshikazu Takeuchi wrote the novel Perfect Budu Kanzen Hentai, translating to Perfect Blue Complete Metamorphosis. It too followed the story of a pop idol dealing with a psychotic stalker. The script would be passed around to various directors. However, before the project could really get off the ground, disaster struck. On January 17th of 1995, the Kobe earthquake hit the Hanshin region of Japan. It was one of Japan's deadliest earthquakes killing over 6,000 people, leaving 45,000 homeless, and causing more than 100 billion in damages. Among the buildings destroyed was the studio in which Perfect Blue was set to film in. With the budget now drastically cut, the studio had no option but to cancel the live-action adaptation indefinitely. The project could only be salvaged as an animated film under the direction of Satoshi Kon. Now, there's one thing I want to clear up real quick. Recently, YouTuber The Kino Corner had this to say about Kon's intentions for the film. It was like I was watching a Japanese Brian De Palma film, and I loved it. And there's a good reason for this. It wasn't intended to be an anime. Satoshi Kon originally intended to shoot Perfect Blue as a live-action film, and he had the money for it. Until he didn't. That actually isn't correct. Yes, Takeuchi did intend for his film to be live-action, but certainly not Satoshi Kon. In a Midnight Eye interview, Khan explains he had no involvement with the live-action adaptation. In fact, Khan and fellow screenwriter Satoyuki Murai felt that the script was lackluster and wouldn't work as a film. The two ended up making so many changes to the script that the end product bore very little resemblance to the novel, aside from a few basic plot points. The idea that Khan intended for the film to be live-action is honestly kind of strange considering the man's entire filmography consists of only animated films. On top of that, Khan's been very vocal of the importance of animation, especially within his own work. My purpose for bringing this up is not to bash the Kino Corner, but to stress the importance of Khan as a director. He had an original creative vision for the film, and would conform for absolutely no one. This wasn't just a live-action film turned animation on a whim, it was the direct intent of a man who knew what he wanted, how'd he do it, and whose changes to the original source would go on to create the classic piece of animation we have today. A great contrast to the man who would eventually direct the live-action version, Toshiki Sato. Toshiki Sato is a Japanese director known for his contributions to the genre of pink films, with many referring to him as one of the four heavenly kings of pink. For those out of the loop, pink films are a cinematic genre which heavily focuses on nudity and sexual content. Fans of these films view them as avant-garde films that push the boundaries of what could be put to screen. I think it's basically porn trying to be art. Oh come on, Zelcher, that's a reductive way to look at films. You gotta show some respect to films like Soaking Wet, Touching All Over the Body, and E-Cup, Real Action, Take Two, Rich and Ripe. Oh, and here's a good one, Extremely Wild, Genuine Sex. Now that's straightforward. To his credit though, Sato was attempting to transition to mainstream films while also keeping his erotic edge. And what better film to direct than Perfect Blue, an already successful film. Better yet, he was even given similar creative freedom over the source material like Khan. He could change everything except that the main character was a pop idol, there had to be a stalker character, 
and there had to be elements of horror. However, unlike Khan, Sato's changes would create a film that was at best boring, and at worst, a complete train wreck. So I'm going to be spoiling both films in this video. If you haven't seen Satoshi Khan's Perfect Blue, I suggest you do so right now, as it's among one of the best anime films ever made. You can probably skip Sato's film, though, I won't judge. Without further ado, I present to you Perfect Blue versus Perfect Blue. Perfect Blue starts with a scene of Power Ranger as characters fighting a monstrous villain. Believe it or not, Satoshi Khan is already implementing ideas of identity and reality questioning. I have described Perfect Blue as a psychological thriller, and yet it opens like this. This is because Satoshi Khan is trying to confuse you. Due to the film's smaller budget, it was meant to be released as an OVA, a direct-to-video movie. Khan's ideal scenario was that someone would rent the film for its more realistic crime thriller plot. They would watch it only to see this out-of-place opening and question if the store had given them a wrong copy. Khan stressed the importance of an opening. He felt that he had to intrigue audiences right from the start in order to keep them invested throughout the film. As we can see, confusion was his way of catching audiences' attention, a constant throughout his filmography. It's an unconventional method for sure, but also one that sets up the themes perfectly. We leave the show and start to see some more realistic looking characters, grounding us back at the reality of the film. Everyone is talking about the rumors of Cham singer Mima possibly retiring from her pop idol career. Over in the dressing room, the group of singers are frantically getting ready for the show. We see Mima take a deep breath before running onto the stage and into the lights, revealing the title of the film. We cut from that to later in the day where Mima is taking a train back home. This type of sharp editing is a staple of Khan's filmography and makes each scene flow so well into each other. The editing here is used to juxtapose Mima's persona as a pop idol with her normal everyday life. It emphasizes that she's just a regular person, no different from you or I. It's a great example of show don't tell, something that Khan excels at. We also get to see her in meetings with her manager who tries to rebrand her as an actress. Mima herself looks shy and meek in this scene. Very quickly we are shown the complexities within Mima's life. However, she isn't the only focus at the opening. The stalker character Mamania is also introduced. We see him gaze upon her and hold her in the palm of his hand. The message is clear, he holds Mima's pop idol persona on a pedestal, ultimately becoming an unhealthy obsession for him. Mima evades a can from the crowd and disrupts Mamania's view of her, subtle foreshadowing for the conflict between the two. As Mima tries to announce her retirement, a fight breaks out between the stalker and some hecklers. Eventually, they leave, and Mima acknowledges his help with a small smile. Unfortunately, she is unaware that she's feeding into his obsession. As she leaves the stadium, a fan mentions he frequents the site Mima's room. This confuses her and stays in her mind all the way back home. I'd say this is a pretty good opening. It sets up the themes in a subtle way, it sets up the inciting incident of the plot, and establishes the frantic and fast-paced structure of the film. With it being just an hour and a half, this film is paced very quickly and with a lot of purpose behind each scene. It's only natural considering this is an animated film, where, despite the budget, Khan could implement his creative ideas more easily than live action. Speaking of which, we should get to that film. Perfect Blue 2002 opens with whistling and a moving car. Not a bad shot, but it lingers far too long for something that really gives us no information. We then meet the character Ai, essentially just the character Mima, but with a name change. Also, I hope you like this song she's whistling, cause you're gonna hear it quite a bit in this film. There's not really much I can say about this opening scene, as a lot of it is just driving shots. Eventually, her manager asks her what song she's whistling, and she reveals it's called If This Is A Dream, Please Awaken Me. I want to say this is a subtle implementation of the film's themes or ideas, but dreams actually don't play much of a role in this film at all. It's the song itself that becomes far more important. 
The song was written by Ai's friend who committed suicide after having an affair with a teacher who did not love her back. Now, it feels weird to rag on a suicide scene, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Did you get this ragdoll from the Catwoman set? Did you not have better sound effects than this? Honestly, this scene would have been much better if it just cut off right here. Let the audience fill in the rest. We got brains, we can interpret things. It should be obvious by now that these are two very different films. However, what makes this comparison so interesting is seeing how two directors tackle the same concept and source material. We can also see the details that make Khan's film such a masterpiece and why Sato's film is such a damn mess. Speaking of which, this opening also introduces the stalker character. However, you wouldn't immediately know that. The first two minutes are just him waking up and going about his daily routine. With nothing to bounce this off, it becomes two minutes of nothing, really. We do eventually see his obsession when he prays to a poster of Ai, but I'd argue it still isn't enough. Hitoshi Khan made it perfectly clear the kind of obsession Mamania had towards Mima. The stalker here comes off more as a sad, lonely individual with a crush on a model he'll never meet. So yeah, that was the opening to Sato's film. We've taken the same amount of time and we've learned almost nothing about the main characters. We know more about Ai's friend and that bitch is already dead. Instead of confusing the audience by subverting our expectations, Sato instead does it by not giving us any information. Quite the bold move. Back in Khan's film, Mima is resting in her apartment. We are shown various shots of the room and how small it is. She gets a call from her mother who questions her career change. In the middle of this conversation, she gets a call from her stalker. She tries to ignore it but soon gets a fact sent to her that reads traitor. There's a reason why I offer praise to the mundane and seemingly uneventful shots in Khan's film. These shots of the apartment focus on the cramped and messy environment that is her apartment. Also, we see dolls and stuffed animals scattered on the floor. This is her home, and like any other home, it offers an escape from the outside world, away from the stress and anxiety of her career. However, her mother breaks that escape by questioning her decision over the phone. The escape is further broken when this unknown note infiltrates her room. While we're here, I want to mention this video by Bredward. In it, he analyzes the use of color and lighting in this film, and by doing so, offers a different reading of the film. Particularly, he had a lot to say about this scene. I'm only going to cover the basics of what makes this film so good, so if you want to dive deeper into the perfect blue rabbit hole, I highly suggest giving this video a watch. So despite this being a simple sequence, there's quite a lot you can interpret from it. That's because there's purpose behind the mundane, and that's not something you can say about Sato's film. We transition to the next day where Mima is practicing the only line she has for a show called Double Bind. The line is, who are you? Again, alluding to the themes of identity in the film. Mima tells her manager Rumi about her fan website, while her other manager Tarakoro tries to get her more screen time. Mid-conversation, he's given Mima's fan mail, which he proceeds to open. Before she can say her line, the letter explodes and injures his hand. These once empty insults are starting to become actual threats. Back in her room, Rumi installs a computer for Mima so that she can visit the website herself. However, upon checking it out, she's scared to see how accurate it is to her life. Just for a second, I want to take a detour and talk about the perceived relationship Hitoshi Khan has with the internet. On YouTube, you'll find a plethora of videos analyzing Perfect Blue as an early commentary of social media and online stalking. It's led some to believe that Khan was a pioneer and expert of internet culture. It's a fair connection, however, it might surprise you that this wasn't his intention at all. Khan didn't even own a computer before Perfect Blue, and only started using one after it was released. He often compares himself to Mima in that they both struggled with using this technology.
A far more consistent theme in both this film and his whole filmography is the idea of the persona. What we show to the public, what we show to those close to us, and what we try to hide. Khan uses the internet to more easily create a doppelganger for Mima, one that resembles who she used to be, forcing her to question who she is now and what she really wants. That internal conflict is the focus of Perfect Blue. All that said, you can interpret the film any way you want. In fact, Hitoshi Khan will tell you that firsthand. I just thought it was funny that many call him an internet fortune teller just for a few scenes in Perfect Blue. I mean, he's made other films about different topics, and I'd argue Paprika focuses way more on the internet than this film. But I guess you can never really shake off your most famous work. Yamagishi Ryogo san, manga ga. De watashi dake ga de Perfect Blue kantoku te kaite ru desu yo ne. Ano, e. Watashi shokugyo Perfect Blue kantoku te. Ano, hiroku gentei sareta. Anyways, enough of my dumb ramblings. Let's see what's going on in Sato's film. We see Ai do a little bit of modeling until her photographer suggests she do a provocative pose. Her manager gets angry, goes off about how they have principles, and drops a job. There's actually a similar scene to this in Khan's film, but I'll compare the two later. All we can take away from this scene now is that the relationship between Ai and her manager is different to Khan's film, since they have quote unquote principles. A little ironic considering who's directing this film. Actually, it's really ironic considering how this film was marketed with a poster showing the actress's nude body. Now, I'm definitely not saying that we have to see her nude. It's just genuinely strange to me that they have this poster, they actually got a pink film director, and then did nothing with that. You're supposed to be a director of a taboo, yet this is as far as you go. It's not even like this scene is all that important to the plot. You can take it out of the film and it changes nothing. This film is filled with all kinds of weird choices, so let's move on. We see Toshihiko, the stalker, working at a convenience store. He talks with this old lady, and you know what, this scene is kind of boring. In fact, you'll see that a lot of scenes of Toshihiko are rather boring. Sato is trying to create a backstory for the stalker character, and surprisingly, that's accurate to how Takeuchi wrote him. It was Khan's original idea to strip the stalker of any sort of backstory since he felt the character just wasn't interesting. That decision actually works to his benefit. Most people find fear in the unknown. When we see a random dude stalk and make Mima's life a living hell, that's scary. In this conversation, Sato reveals that Toshihiko actually knew of Ai before her modeling career. Later we learn that he knew her since they were kids, and you know, it just doesn't work. I'm not scared of him. It doesn't help that he acts really pathetic and is kind of a wimp. I thought that maybe they got an unknown actor and he was doing a bad job, so I looked up who it was. And lo and behold, it was now Omori, better known for his role as Ichi the Killer just a year prior. If there's anyone that could pull off the unsettling mannerisms of the stalker, it would be this guy. You got a great actor and you gave him almost nothing to work with. Why? Now we're back with Ai as she walks back home. It's just a regular unbroken sequence of her walking. There's nothing of substance here, my dude. Am I watching Birdemic or something? While in her room, she starts playing her dead friend's song. Hope you like it because they play the full song. Listen, we only recorded one song for the film and damn it are we getting our money's worth. I was gonna try and analyze the song for any deeper meaning, but go figure, it has none. It's just a generic, sad love song. The only notable lyric is this one. If this is a dream, please awaken me. However, spoiler alert, dreams, or even the breaking of reality, don't play a role in the story at all. So yeah, there's nothing here. It's essentially just an amateur music video for a forgettable song that goes on for five minutes straight. Might I add that this film is actually longer than Khan's version, and it's because it's filled with bullshit like this. Before we all doze off, why don't we go back to Khan's timeline. Both of Mima's managers are watching over the show, which Mima only has one scene in. 
Rumi thinks that they should make her a pop idol again, but Tadakoro reminds her that the industry isn't as profitable given the fact that she herself didn't last long in it. However, it seems he spoke too soon. Cham reveals that they just reached the top 100 list. Mima makes her way to the office, but she's still very uneasy about the website. She passes some fans who chastise her for not acknowledging them. As she enters an elevator, she notices a newspaper headline detailing the hit and run of one of the hecklers at her concert. As she looks back, she sees the stalker among the crowd of fans. At the office, she learns of Cham's success and reminisces about their start. She's also handed her script for the show, now with more lines. I really like this shot here, contrasting the two career paths. Mima's career starts to take an unfortunate turn when she's asked to perform a brutal rape scene. Rumi pushes back, but Mima agrees to it. She says it'll be a good way to prove herself as an actress. But she's clearly not happy about it. On her way home, a reflection of her pop idol persona appears and repeats what's on her mind. <laughs> The scene begins filming the next day. The managers are visibly uncomfortable. Another person who would be uncomfortable would be Satoshi Khan, who thought that he made the scene a little too graphic. Nevertheless, there is purpose behind what's shown. There are malicious motives behind why this scene is even in the show. The writer is taking advantage of Mima's desire to be an actress, and writes in an erotic taboo scene. This is emphasized through phallic symbolism in the camera as it moves upward like an erect penis. This scene is filmed for the sexual gratification of the higher-ups. Furthermore, Mima is shown in a reclusive pose as well as being shot from above to emphasize the weakness she feels and the lack of control she has over her career and image. The scene begins and it's just as brutal as Khan says. This scene is very important as it represents the death of Mima the pop idol. It's no coincidence that she's even dressed in similar clothing. Her image is now forever changed. She can no longer return to her innocent persona. Back home, she goes to feed her fish, but discovers they've all died. With everything that's happened so far, this moment breaks her. She destroys her apartment, exclaiming how she didn't want to do the scene. <laughs> Once again, pop idol Mima appears just to mock her. Mima is left just to look at the screen, frightened over what happened. This scene leaves such an impact due in part to the great voice acting by Junko Iwao, who captures the emotion of someone at the lowest point in their life. This was a tough role for her considering she had no prior experience voicing scenes like rape, almost like a parallel to her character. With help and encouragement from the crew, she was able to give a fantastic performance. Things are heating up in Khan's film, so why don't we go see what's going on in Sato's? So Ai gets a phone call from her manager telling her that the photographer was just being a creep and they'll get a new one soon enough. He also asks her to bring a recording of that song she was singing. During their conversation, the manager's wife cuts her hand on some glass. Even what I know happens in this film, I still think this scene is stupid, but keep it in mind for later, I guess. Ai goes to mail a package and uh-oh, she meets the stalker. So here's the funny thing. This one poster is the only modeling job Ai has actually done. And this dude here has already labeled himself as a huge fan. You'd think this would set off some red flags, but no, she thinks it's pretty neat. Worst yet, he reveals he knows way too much about her life, like where she went to school, and where she got her dental work done as a kid. Girl, why are you not running? So yeah, now they're the best of friends or whatever. I sure am glad there's no conflict to keep me invested in the plot. Good one, Sato. Lucky for us, we get to see Toshihiko during his job. The purpose for this scene is for his manager to tell him he looks like a girl. The small amount of facial hair he has even starts to fall off. And yes, this is all important for later. 
Now Ai gets to do some clean modeling. She also gives a tape of her friend's song to her manager. And oh my god, they're playing the song in its entirety again. We literally heard this song less than 15 minutes ago, but hey, who needs an actual plot when you can just play the main theme over and over again? So the manager likes the song and wants Ai to perform it for a commercial, effectively rebranding her as a pop idol. Now I want to put things into perspective here. We are around 40 minutes into this film, and we are just now starting a change in this character. What we've been experiencing so far has just been set up for the two main characters, a good portion of which was just padded out with this damn song. It was at this point where I realized this was not just a weak reinterpretation of Perfect Blue. This was legitimately a bad film, one that didn't care about pacing, plot, characters, or any cinematic elements. There isn't a single thing thus far that I could even remotely compliment. Now some weak elements are due in part to it being faithful to the source material, but most of the problems are Sato original ideas. Why do we spend 10 minutes listening to the same song twice, and guess what? That's not even the last time we'll hear it. What is wrong with you? <sighs> Let's just go back to Khan's film. In complete contrast to the previous scene, Mima is giving interviews about how this graphic scene was a big step forward in her career. This is the persona she must embody for the public. However, there are people who actually comment their disapproval over her career change. Back home, Mima is obsessed with looking at the Mima's Room website, although now it no longer documents her life, but instead roleplays as her. This virtual Mima claims she's being forced to be an actress but all she really wants to be is a pop idol. The page is revealed to be run by the stalker, who is trying to mold Mima back into the image he wants. Despite that, this still manages to create a conflict within Mima, who actually does feel all these things even if she denies it. This paranoia manifests itself into an illusion of her pop idol persona, who proceeds to mock her and fly out the window. The line between fiction and reality are starting to blur for her. We are then shown a scene of the writer alone as he is stalked and then killed, all while a cham song plays in the background. The next day, Mima hears the news and thinks that the attack is somehow connected to her. Tadakoro tells her that's silly and that she should relax. Before she can though, virtual Mima appears just to taunt her. A neat detail about the scene is the notable color change upon entering the tunnel meant to emphasize the feelings of anxiety and paranoia that are engulfing her. Today is an eventful day. Cham is performing a live show while Mima has her first modeling job. However, her photographer has a reputation for coercing new models to do revealing shots. The sequence cuts between Cham and Mima's work to contrast the two career paths. Eventually, Mima doesn't want to continue, forcing everyone to wait for her to compose herself. Unlike Sato's film, this scene actually presents a real conflict for the character. Part of the reason why Mima has gone to this point is because she doesn't want to be a letdown to the people around her. She believes that everyone has worked so hard to give her a career that she simply cannot fail now and waste their time, no matter how much she suffers. That same conflict is not present in Sato's film. Ai and her manager somehow have enough influence to just replace their creepy photographer, despite this being her second modeling job. In fact, they have way more control over their image than Mima does. Now you could say that this film is going for a different conflict, but then what's the purpose of this scene? Anyway, Mima sinks back into a dark mental state, at which point virtual Mima reappears to taunt her. Back home, the way her clothes are scattered implies that she was at her computer screen obsessing over the Mima's room page. Over in her bathroom, we see one of the film's most memorable shots. Shot from a bird's eye view, we see Mima submerge in her bathtub. She then proceeds to yell. This is a person who has lost control of their life and can do nothing else but scream. There are a lot of details in this scene that you can read into. The claustrophobic setting of the bathtub emphasizes a feeling of being trapped. The water, usually a symbol of life and harmony, is contrasted with her desperate cry. It all blends so well and creates a fantastic scene. 
The next day, Mamania buys every single magazine of Mima he can find, ripping them from the hands of other people. A desperate attempt to preserve her image to the public. Back at his home, we see that Mamania has been in contact with someone claiming to be Mima. This virtual Mima tells him that the other Mima is an imposter ruining her image. He then assures her that he will get rid of her. During all this, his shrine of posters thank him for his service. Oh boy, things are kind of getting tense over here. Let's see what Sato's up to. So Ai is on her way to tell her bestie about her big music gig. And yes, we have to watch her run all the way there. Every second of it. Yup. None of this running matters since she has to wait for his shift to end anyways. Although I'm glad we still have this scene, it adds a lot to the plot and character. So now these two very interesting characters get to talk to one another. My favorite thing about this conversation is how she acknowledges he's a stalker, but you know what, that's kinda cool. Might want to hold that thought because this guy reveals he knows way too much about her life. Again. Because the first time didn't bother her at all. First he reveals that he knows about her dead friend and the song. Next he reveals he's actually living like her, setting up his apartment just like hers. And finally, to explain that, he reveals that he knew her since she was abandoned at her dental place as a kid. And it's from that moment he decided he wanted to live like her. Keep in mind though, this was the only time he ever saw her. Yes, they actually emphasize that in the script. So all I can think is, how? How did you shape your life to be like hers if you've never seen her past this age? How do you even know this model was her when you've only seen her as a kid? The most important question, how did you not think this was stupid? So now she finally realizes that this guy is kind of a freak and ditches him. Good job girl, I'm proud of you. So the next day, Ani tries to sing the song in a studio, but uh, she kind of sucks. Thankfully, Sato spares us from hearing the song in full again, but I'm sure he really wanted to. On the car ride back home, Ai goes, Oh man, I'm a bad singer, huh? And her manager goes, Yeah, but like, don't give up, kid. And that's the scene. I mean, there's more to his speech, but that's the gist of it. Don't worry, girl, I'm gonna make you a star, even if you have no talent. Which, true to his word, the next day they do a bit of beach modeling. This is certainly progressing the plot forward. If it feels like nothing has really happened, well guess what? We are actually past the timestamp for Khan's version. We are more than halfway through this film and I feel like the plot has just started. Anyways, let's go back to Khan's film. Mima starts to see hallucinations of the stalker and her virtual persona during her everyday life. It gets to a point where she can no longer tell the difference between what is real and what is an illusion, what's reality and what's a dream. It's purposefully abrupt, reflecting Mima's chaotic mental state. It all flows so seamlessly that it's hard for even the audience to distinguish what's reality. Khan effectively puts us into the mind of the character, and it's fantastic. This all takes a great toll on her as we see her obsess over her fan website. She starts to believe what's on the page is her reality. The way she appears is comparable to that of Mamania. The photographer who shot her nude is watching Mima's show when his pizza arrives. The delivery boy acts a little shady before stabbing him in the eye. He also gets stabbed in the dick. These two body parts are chosen for their association with lust. He viewed Mima in a perverted way and is now being punished for it. The song playing in the background is actually Mamania's own theme, which implies he's the one doing this. However, as the scene continues, the person's face becomes Mima's, only for her to then wake up. Unfortunately, what wakes her up is a phone call from her manager informing her of the murder. Worse yet, she finds incriminating evidence in her room. At the same time, the media tries to barge in and ask her about the murder. Mima's home has played a very important role as a safe space for her, a place away from the pressure of society. However, that sense of safety has finally been destroyed and all she can do now is stare. 
On set, she had to perform a murder scene that is eerily familiar to what happened in real life. It comes as such a shock that she faints. She wakes up next to a psychiatrist and tells her that she's a pop idol Mima and not an actress. The psychiatrist diagnoses her with Dissociative Identity Disorder and links all the murders back to her. However, as the camera zooms out, we see this was all shown on a screen. Watching the footage back, we see the scene correctly with Mima playing her role. The lights turn on and she receives a round of applause. The show is now complete. Although for Mima, it doesn't seem like she knew what was real and what wasn't. We're close to the end, but let's check up on Sato for a second. We're back at work with Toshihiko because that's always fun. He actually ends up running out due to feeling kind of weird. He gets back home and whoops, he's got baby hands. Although that's the least of his worries because he also has no dick. Listen, you can already tell what's gonna happen. During this stormy night, Toshihiko bends over on the ground. As lightning strikes, he becomes Ai. What the actual fuck? Was this in the book? Is this how the original story went? Has Perfect Blue been a body swapping fantasy this whole time? Or maybe this was a Sato original idea? I don't know, who's responsible for this decision? But hey, you know what, I don't judge. If you want to be a girl now, then so be it. He's not Asian, he's Zelturian. That's a good way of looking at it, yeah. I'm a, I'm a hot anime girl with pink hair. That'd be pretty cool, that'd be pretty neat, epic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind being a pretty... <laughs> We're gonna end that sentence right there. So I guess this was his plan all along, I think. I don't know, he seemed pretty surprised by the whole thing. But he did fix his room to look just like hers, so I guess he's been planning this since he was a kid. Alright, I'm looking for answers in a plot that provides none, so let's move on. So, surprise surprise, Ai still sucks at singing. As if she'd get better overnight. Her manager decides to get her dinner to make her feel better, but oh no, his wife catches them. So there's been this whole side plot of his wife getting jealous, but it's done in the most boring and uninteresting way. How do I analyze this? I don't care about this subplot, but it's important to the story, I guess. Out of nowhere, Ai confesses her feelings for her manager, which he rejects because he's a professional man. Ah man, friend zoned again. For some reason, she goes to the supermarket her stalker works at. Guess she's trying to rebound onto him or something. Well, he's not there, so she gets his address from the manager. She must be down horrendous. She goes to his apartment and is about to come face to face with herself. But before that, let's finish Khan's film. With the show now over, all Mima has left to do is change her clothes while her managers wait outside. While in the halls, she runs into her co-star who tells her something quite strange. <laughs> The next second, she comes face to face with her stalker. A fight ensues on the stage of her rape scene. In fact, some actions even mimic the same scene. She finishes him with a blow to the head and he falls down, mimicking yet another scene. As she looks down in horror, an imaginary audience claps for her. Mima finds Rumi in the halls and tries to show her the stalker's body, but he's gone. Rumi takes Mima back home. Upon waking up, she tries to call Tarakoro. No one picks up, and we are shown his dead body right next to Mamania's. Mima notices that her fish are strangely still alive, and upon checking the window, realizes this isn't her apartment. Rumi comes out wearing the cham outfit, claiming herself to be the real Mima. She also claims that Mima has been tarnishing her image by being an actress. She tried to get Mamania to kill her, but he failed. So now she's here to finish the job. I want to note that this room setup is a lot more realistic than Sato's film, 
since we've seen Rumi inside of her apartment multiple times. Also, the fish died as a result of Mima's anxiety consuming her life, causing her to forget to feed them. However, Rumi is roleplaying an idealized version of her, and so they remain alive. Rumi's desire to be Mima is subtly revealed in the beginning of the film, when Tarakaro mentions she failed as a pop idol. She's trying to reclaim that fame, that persona. It's the small details that count. Mima escapes the apartment and a chase ensues. If there's anything you should know about Khan, it's that his chase scenes are very intense and creative. I can't show it all here, so you gotta watch it for yourself. Eventually, Mima is cornered and is about to be killed. During the struggle, she removes Rumi's wig, and she goes insane. Trying to pick it back up, she ends up stabbing herself on some glass. She stumbles over to the road, giving us another famous shot from the film. As a truck gets closer, Rumi imagines its lights to be concert lights, and welcomes them with open arms. However, Mima saves her at the last second. Time passes and we see Rumi in a psychiatric hospital. She looks in a mirror and still sees pop idol Mima. The real Mima comments on how she'll never see her again. This has a dual meaning. It refers to how she'll never see Rumi sane again, but it also refers to her pop idol career. In the final shot of the film, Mima enters her car, looks in the mirror, and says this. We don't know how exactly her career is going, but she seems much more content with her identity now. So that was Perfect Blue. At least some of it. You see, this film has a lot of layers and I've only covered a fraction of it. You could dissect each scene of this film for its use of color, lighting, symbolism, or dialogue. It's bound to be a unique experience for anyone. In fact, after seeing it again for this video, it started to resonate with me more than ever before. The ideas of identity and personas were something I could connect with my own YouTube channel. You all know me as Zelcher, a polished version of myself, known for his research, analysis of film, and has the confidence to stream himself to his followers. However, you don't know Henry, the man filled with all sorts of fears and insecurities. Truth be told, I'm not entirely sure who Zelcher is or what I want him to be. The idea of a public image hadn't really crossed my mind until now. Being Zelcher is a whole new experience for me, essentially a blank slate. And that's equal parts exciting and terrifying, considering how many people are potentially watching and judging. But hey, enough of that wishy-washy crap, let's finish off Sato's film. So the manager and his wife are starting to fight. Apparently, this guy was also being really cozy with one of his past clients, but she was killed before her big break. She tries to imply that he killed her, and that something may happen to Ai too. He leaves angry, and that's the scene. So, fake Ai lets real Ai into her room, and immediately she's super hostile. She confronts her about stealing and commercializing her friend's song. A flashback takes place showing what really happened during her suicide. Apparently, she was just standing over the edge of a building when Ai pushed her off. She then steals a song her friend made. Fake Ai claims it's for this reason she will never sing the song properly. Now, a few things. One, this is still supposed to be Toshihiko, right? Cause he's acting really out of character for someone who's obsessed with Ai. In fact, he devised his Living Like You plan when they were kids, way before all this drama started. Which means this cannot be Toshihiko. This is a completely different character. So if that's the case, why did we spend so much time developing the stalker as a character? You gave him a backstory and a personality. Then you just drop him during the final act. We now have a completely different antagonist with a completely different motive. Not only were his scenes boring, but now they're also pointless. I guess story structure is kinda hard when you can't insert porn scenes, huh? The next day is the last day Ai has to record the song, but uh-oh, she's sick. And yeah, she sucks again. Oh no, I'll never be famous now. Oh, here's my favorite scene. Fake Ai appears just to taunt Ai. Sound familiar, guys? And look, she was just an illusion too. 
a little too late to start copying Khan there. Luckily, the manager is able to get one more day of recording. Yay, I was so worried Ai would miss her big chance. Later that night, Ai is struggling with her ailment while fake Ai watches from outside her apartment. We are then shown her flashback of the event and how things went down. So this girl promised she would write love songs and then let Ai sing them, so that Ai could become a pop idol. But then she decides to sing them herself because she was the one who experienced heartbreak. But whoa, that was a fake out, she actually is going to let Ai sing them. Double twist, she's actually going to jump off the building to ensure that her friend Ai achieves her dreams. There she goes. You don't want to maybe stop her? No. She's struggling over here. Now's your chance. No? Okay then. What is wrong with you? So that's the real event, I guess. I'm half expecting a third flashback to show what really happened. Star, let me tell you something. You are such a good TF2 player. You know, you won the duel. Then I'm gonna ship my pants. So you don't have to show any more footage. You win. It's over. Fake Ai is still outside for whatever reason, but uh oh, it's the manager's wife. And she's readying her scissors. Uh. Are we sure this isn't a comedy? So her bringing up her husband's previous client was just a red herring. Doesn't really work all that well when it's done 10 minutes before the end of the film, but whatever, here we are. Rest in pepperoni, my sweet prince. The final scene of the film has her singing the song in full again, but now she does it correctly. Now, hold on one second. I couldn't sing this song correctly because fake Ai accused her of killing her friend. Her quote-unquote guilt prevented her from singing it well. But she knew that accusation was bullshit because she was actually there. All you had to do was remember one of the most important parts of your life. Or maybe it wasn't important, judging by this reaction time. Essentially, the actual conflict in this film should not have even existed. All you had to do was think. All you had to do was think. This film is just one mistake after another, and now it's over. That's it. The end. Goodbye. Fuck this film. So that was Perfect Blue and Perfect Blue. Hopefully now you realize why Satoshi Kon's film is so beloved and influential, while Sato's film is so forgettable you didn't even know it existed until this video. At the very least, we can rejoice knowing that no one will ever attempt to recreate the unique masterpiece that is Perfect Blue. Oh. Oh no. Hey everybody, it's me. Hope you all enjoyed that video. It took quite a lot out of me. Health problems and personal issues kept slowing down my progress on what I think is my most ambitious project to date. Love that that happened, like, at the same time. I am a master of timing. I want to thank the people who supported me on Patreon. The fact that anyone would even donate really hits me right in the heart. I really appreciate it. These are the current $5 patrons who get their names shown at the end of every video. Check out the rest of the tiers in the link below. Also join the Discord if you want. I also got a new wave of subs recently, so hopefully you all watched this video. Let me know down below if you did, because I didn't sell my soul to the iceberg, so I need all the help I can get with my new content. And yeah, that's that. Uh, I'll see you all later.